This is a photo of me uh, circa 1985. <laughs> I'm the guy on the right, your right if you can't recognize me, and I'm happy. I'm happy because I just started my first business. I had missed all my final exams, and it was a student storage business. What we did is we picked up students' goods at the end of the school year, stored them for the summer, and brought them back in the fall. Now, I'm happy having my first venture, but I know at this moment my mom is not happy at all. <laughs> See, I'm Jewish, and of Jewish heritage, I was born, and I was given two contracts to choose from when I came out. One was to be a doctor, and the other one was to be a lawyer. <laughs> I signed the contract to be a physician, and my entire life was sciences. And I loved it. I loved being in sciences. And in my senior year at university, I decided to throw everything into the wind, and I threw my mom into the wind. The challenge was, when I started my first business, there were a few things that happened. I realized that I had not learned anything about how to run a business, how to work in business my entire life. And here I was, and I think my mom was scared for me. So I did three things to start to improve my condition. The first is I started reading, and to use more contemporary books, I'll say I was learning how to be great, learning how to tip, and looking for oceans. And the truth was in all those books, when I look through the pages, there's no answers there, just concepts. I also saw a large disconnect second when I started to look around at the people who were admired at the time. There was this guy by the name of Jack Welch. He took General Electric and he built it up into this amazing empire. But Jack's nickname was Neutron Jack. That's not a loving, kinding, being nice to your neighbor name. And there was this other guy, I can list several of them, but there's a guy by the name of Stephen Jobs. Now, Stephen was so, so much of a tyrannical innovator that people were afraid to get on an elevator with him and go down because by the time they got to the bottom, he was firing them. <laughs> that didn't make sense because all the literature was saying, be kind to your neighbor, be kind to everybody, treat everybody well. And if my last thing I started doing was asking questions, and I'm assuming you ask some of these questions too. For example, why do you have companies with great people and they produce subpar results? Then you get people with average people and they do amazing work. Why are some companies full of happy people and others are not? And I couldn't find a correlation with them. I was challenged, I was so frustrated that I didn't know what's, where to step because I felt as if I wasn't sure what was right. But I guess to my uh, persona, I was curious. I was curious as to how I can solve this and I really, I stuck to making new types of realities happen in my life. I looked at the questions and I said, well, what if I change the paradigms? What if I said there are new answers here that I can solve? What I did was different. I said, what if we had a different way of looking at everything that we believed in? Today we have these phrases such as people are the most important part of an organization. We've heard this countless times. And it didn't make sense to me like those books did and those stories did. So let me try something with you and let's see if it works for you. If people are the most important part of an organization, let's take you as an individual. And I'm assuming most of you think that you're pretty good at what you do, whether you're a student or you're at work. Okay. So let's say for the next month I took away all screens from you. You couldn't look at your mobile phone. You couldn't look at the, your computer screens. You couldn't look at anybody else's screens. How productive will you be? Come on, some of you have lost your phone access for a half hour and gone ballistic. There's some of you saying, that would be great, I'd be away. But most of you inherently will know that you will not be as productive. But it's just a screen. You're talented. Let's make another jump. Let's go to, for example, one of the all-time race car drivers of, uh, in history, winning um, Michael Schumacher, and he's about to race you. You're going to show up at the racetrack. He has a Formula One vehicle. 
you are given a minivan. Okay, it's Luxembourg. Maybe you don't know what a minivan is. Maybe it's a Porsche. <laughs> that work? It's still the same race. Who's going to win? If you were in it, you'd probably say, well, Michael's going to win. He's the better driver. But let's step back a little bit and take a look at that same imagery. And the truth is that Michael has his Formula One cars up on cinder blocks. Now who's going to win? But he's the best all-time racer of all time. Are you trying to tell me that in terms of a vehicle, that the inexpensive tires are all the difference it's going to make in terms of him being successful? I thought people were the most important part. We go out and motivate him to do a better job. It doesn't matter. Let's assume that you went to get your hair cut today and the hairstylist showed up with dull scissors. How productive will they be? Let's assume you went to a film crew who was going to produce a filming of some movie and they had James Cameron and they had Angelina Jolie and they had everything set up but there were no cameras on set. How productive will they be? The truth is, or the challenge that we have right now, is we've made an automatic assumption in the context of this paradigm that everything's in place, including the systems and structure, so therefore, if we work on the people, we'll improve things. And I'm suggesting something completely different, that we've done a bad job of creating the systems and structure and the processes and this includes everything from the computer systems you put in place, the, the facility you've built, and includes even policy that's created. That if you worked on solving that first, you'll get 10 times the results and happiness and productivity out of the individuals that you work with. So let me give you an example. I was working with this administration in the United States, and they were spending 300,000 US dollars to hire motivational consultants to come in. They had a morale issue in the organization. Retention and recruitment was difficult. And in my homework, what I do is I often will make phone calls, interviews of individuals. And what I found was this, and one interview stood out tremendously in my mind to this day. This one woman says to me, well, our computers go down two to three hours every day. And then she goes on, wait, 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 stop for a minute. Your computers go down two to three hours every day? Yeah, she says, yeah, we, we've started to scavenge parts to make them work, but every day, two to three hours. And the worst part about it is the management expects us to deliver the exact same amount of work no matter what happens. So I called up the administrator and I said, you don't have a morale issue. You have a systems and structure issue. Fix the computers, fix the systems, and your people will be once again happier. See, our, our mental belief, our, our, our core, our genetic code is that what we want to do is make people happy. So we, when something goes wrong and there's a morale issue, there's a, an issue with the way people are being serviced, what we do is we go inside and say, oh, we've got to take care of our people. You can do it. You can do a good job. I have confidence in you. Incentives are put in place, and I, 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 the term that I use is hugging and kissing. We hug and kiss our people, and what you've got to understand is hugging and kissing is temporary. It doesn't last. If you want to get the highest returns out of the individuals that you have, what you need to do is focus on the systems and structure. You'll get 10 times the return, and you'll be able to leverage the talent that you have. You'll be able to optimize their creativity and innovation. You'll be able to have them do the job that you are expecting. So I'm going to steal out of the Pareto principle rules and, and create a new paradigm for you, hopefully. Hopefully you see this. For some of you who don't know, and this is used light, loosely, Vilfredo Pareto came up with a concept that 80% of the wealth in a community came from 20% of the people. Fast forward many years later, a guy by the name of Koch created a book called The 80-20 uh, Rules, and he, that disseminated where all of us know about this 80-20 principle. But what if 80% of the results in an organization came from the systems and structure in place and not the people? That the people aren't the most important part of an organization, it doesn't mean they're not important. It's just that when you're thinking strategically about changing how you live and work, what if we change that focus? Now, here's a secret. It's actually more than 
But most people here won't accept that because I know right now there are people in the audience saying, this is not for me. I can't accept this. So let me give you a model or a, a picture that you could work from. There's only three blocks, so if you need a copy of it, you can actually draw the three squares. It's not complicated of a model. In the top, we have all the systems and structure in place. For example, we have this facility. Well, imagine if we didn't have this facility, how could we have this TED Talk? Then we have the 20%, and those are the people, those are the talented architects, engineers. They are the chefs. They are the housekeepers, the bookkeepers. These are all the individuals that you know, and many of you who are in this audience today, you're the people in that 20%, and you really love to show up and do a great job. But in the corner, there's another block. And I'd like you to think about what does that block represent? That block is no more important than the other people in that pool, and that's entire square. They're the leadership and management. Their role is to create the systems and structure that allow you to be talented. That's their job. They're paid to think about this, to make it so it optimizes for you. I actually am stepping back physically from the audience for a reason. This is the only thing I've created where I've, my name is on it, and I have to give you the reason why. I'm speaking at this conference, there were about 350 people in the audience, and somewhere during that I wove in the uh, productivity principle. And a few hours later, we're standing around talking, and they're talking about this GPP, and I'm lost. So I whisper over to the guy, what's the GPP? And he says, oh! We've named your principle the Goldsmith Productivity Principle. <laughs> and that's how it got its name. So let's return back. Why are some organizations getting highly productive or, or people who are extremely happy and others not? I would suggest that there are a few things we have to look at to make that happen. The first is companies who understand or individuals who understand that if we change the systems and structure, if we work on that first, if we optimize that first, will end up changing how we all live and work. That the focus has to be a little bit different. What's even a value of doing this, if you go to the GPP first, the people around you can now participate in changing the systems and structure. Because the employees you work with don't have that power. This is how you win. You win by changing the GPP. So let me give you a small, simple scenario. Flight attendants have one challenge, that they always have to go up to a person who's rung the call button. And I've flown a lot, probably many of you have too, where you've looked up at the call button and gone, I just want the light. I don't need the light. I don't need light. I'll read without the light. But a lot of people do press that button, and it makes for an awkward exchange. The flight attendant has to walk out and say, what's wrong, I'm sorry that this happened, and they're apologizing back and forth. So Boeing on their 737s did something absolutely amazing. They moved the button away from the lights, <laughs> and they changed the way they operated. Let's get a little bit bigger. In India, there is a gentleman by the name of H.R. Hatwar, who was head of the meteorological department, a very important part department in the country of India because there are over 600 million individuals who rely on creating agriculture for their survival. It's over 18% of their GDP, and a mistake, or positive or negative, can swing the GDP plus or minus 2% just by making a miscalculation on the weather. So instead of going in and saying, HR, we're going to give you more education, where you can do it, to pat them on the back, a bunch of hugging and kissing, they decided to put in place weather stations and precipitation stations, investing over $600 million. At least what, that's what the article was saying. And when I read it, I said, that makes sense. We're in a world of platforms and technology and leverageability, and yet we still focus on the individual. What if we change that? In my mind, I realized in my career that if I changed who I was, the organizations around me would change. If I focused on those systems and structure, I'd get those results. And even worse than this, there's an underlying message that in organizations, you'll often find individuals who are tasked with helping to make this happen. For example, you work in a coffee shop and things aren't set up right, 
then the, the staff ends up making the changes, moving things around, making it more productive. But that's not their job. And leadership promotes them. You've done a great job. Good, good. Thanks for doing my work. It's not their work. Their work is to do what they're skilled at. I did receive one email, a nasty email one day, because someone heard about the Goldsmith Productivity Principle, and they said, no. And he ripped into me about how horrible I was as an individual, that I didn't care about people. It's the exact opposite. I'm compassionate to the fact that people work in horrible conditions, and they could be simply solved by changing a small little function in the way they operate, a different way to look at policy, a different way to structure the office and the environment. And that's where happiness comes from. If you focus on this one area, you'll see that. Let me take you back home to my family. My kids, and we had two young boys, my, pa my wife and myself, we had two young boys. We still have two young boys. They would argue at about eight, and four and five years old, they'd argue about who's watching what show. And my wife, being a fantastic mother, would sit them down to teach them the principles of communicating with one another, understanding conflict, being able to accept other people's decisions. And I would sit there saying, make a chart. No, 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 honey. I'm dealing with this. And this would go on and on and on. And one day I said, I'm going to make a chart. So I went into my room, I powered up my computer, and I took out a spreadsheet and systems and structure have to be done right. I said, well, what I want to do is I want to make them be able to go over every day, start at the beginning of a day, each one alternating. So because I have two children, I have to go 14 days. i got to think this through. And then I made the chart. Every half hour, it would alternate. We put up a clock near the television, and we sat them down and had a little powwow together. And we said to the kids, there are two rules. It's very simple. The first rule is you could swap with your brother anytime you want. You could watch any show you'd like, any time. You could watch multiple shows. It doesn't matter what you do. That's up to you. But rule number two is this. If something goes wrong, if you disagree with one another, then we always go by the chart. The chart wins. How many fights do you think we had? None. Now, my wife is not here to vouch for this, but it went on for years. <laughs> you don't have to just take my word for it. The systems and structure actually empowered them. It didn't disempower them. It made them be able to negotiate with one another because they knew that the policy and the tools were empowering to them. I equate this to the movie The Matrix, and for some, some of you who've seen it, you understand this concept, but others who haven't, there's a major character in the movie, Keanu Reeves, and Keanu has been brought up in a computer-simulated world. He breaks out of it, and he's shown that there's this computer world and this reality world. But at one point throughout the movie, and I'm not going to break everything for you in terms of the, the plot or destroy that for you, what happens is he starts to see something new. He starts to see the world around him as different. And once he does, he's able to change the world around him. I would suggest that if you started to look at the world looking at the GPP first, you'll find it everywhere. How you walked in, the seats you're in, the jobs you've taken, when you go to the supermarket, when you deal with the, your, your teacher's union or you, teach, you deal with the government, it doesn't matter. It's everywhere. And we have been sold that people are the most important part of an organization. They are important, but not in this context. So what I suggest to you is this. I suggest to you if you put on a different set of lenses, You'll change your future and your life. Wish you the best of luck.